running was the priority. The train is on the tracks and there's just nothing that's ever gonna slow it down. Meet Noah Drati, the mustachioed, beer drinking hero. Knowing that my like future in sport was on the chopping block if I didn't run well. I was no longer a professional athlete. Drati looks like a homeless guy who stole a new pair of shoes. It's been said a billion times. Could the gentleman in the back stop playing Pac-Man during the <laughs> during the press conference, please? <laughs> Can I have double drinks up here? I did take one acting class my senior, like my second semester of my senior year. <clears throat> How's that? Noah, Noah. Yeah, yeah, in the back. So I know everyone's wondering, when will you be racing again? Do you want me to answer the question now? Great. That is awesome. I remember seeing it, but I never heard you know, how it came about. Old, that's old school karate. This is this great. Yeah, okay. I don't. That's the stuff we're going to talk about in your interview. Great. I don't necessarily want this in the video because this is stuff I was supposed to drop off at Goodwill <laughs> a year and a half ago. And if Emma sees it in my trunk, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> so. Do you want me to drop it off for you? Yeah. That's the reason. Yeah, I really just don't want to. I was a pretty average athlete in high school. I never made the state meet. And when I was looking at colleges, I wasn't really looking at colleges with the idea that I'd be running anywhere. I wasn't, no, I wasn't gonna get a D1 offer. Coaches weren't calling or knocking on the door. But I realized there was a third division in the NCAA, Division Three, which basically anybody can go and run. And much the same way I wasn't like a collegiate caliber athlete coming out of high school, I was not a professional caliber athlete coming out of college. And so that was the end. It was a good career. Took an internship in Chicago, moved back to Indiana, where I'm from, became a gardener, uh, worked at a running store. It was just generally aimless and kind of bounced around. Um, until the end of 2015, basically, and I started feeling this, this itch that there was something in my life I just hadn't explored all the way through, and I kept coming back to running. It was really just being like, oh, there's something unique about me. Like, I'm good at distance running. Like, what a shame if I wasted it. What's up, ESPN? Thanks for spending the day with me. I go back to my mansion. <laughs> So once I made that, that decision, it was more about figuring out where I had to go to pursue it. And so I started reaching out to different coaches and running teams around the country, but my personal bests on paper were not competitive on any team in the country, basically. Um, so nobody got back to me with one exception, and that was Richie Hansen um, in Boulder, Colorado, who had just started a group called the Roots Running Project. And he was like, if you'll move to Boulder, I'll coach you. You know, he had nothing to lose, and uh, I had nothing to lose, and so I was like, I'll be there in three weeks. So this is the 2007 Kia Rio, very famous year in the Kia Rio line. It's the only car I've ever had. My wife teases me that I'm like emotionally attached to this car, and I like definitely am. It's like definitely a piece of shit car. Like, it's not a nice car. Um, but it's been like the vehicle that's transported me to every like, adventure or a turning point or whatever I've done. If you do have people hanging out in the back seat, they want to get some air, you want to make sure that they have the opportunity to roll down the window. So you're going to want to keep a wrench in the back seat. You just grab that. And what you got there is fresh air. When I moved out here, I only brought the car. I had no furniture. I had like one pan and clothes and like two guitars just like slammed up in the top and a bike on the back. Running was the priority. And so I decided if I was gonna structure my life in a way to pursue my ultimate potential in distance running, like 
everything else would kind of take a back seat and I'd have to make sacrifices. It wasn't about like starting a Roth IRA. It was like about getting faster. I had enough savings to get through a couple months. I ended up working at a running store part time and then eventually got a second job at this horrible gym. And so I was working half a day at the running store and then a few days a week working 5 to 10 p.m. at the gym. No health insurance, no car insurance, uh, no safety net at all, but I was eating and paying rent. Don't say anything heinous. Welcome to SOS Hydration. <laughs> the warehouse manager, Noah Drotti. Come on in. <laughs> This is all SOS product that has been meticulously uh, hauled onto these shelves. And this is where I spend my time during the day. You do excel at teaching others how to distract. Yeah. I've learned how to distract. Distra the two Ds of management, yeah. distract, delegate. And deflect. <laughs> and deflect. Three Ds. The three Ds. Three deflect, Ds. delegate, and distract. Yes. So anyway, it's. It's nice to know that I'm coming to work every day and making a difference in the lives of my employees. I was also validated by pretty immediate success. I had made running the number one thing in my life for the first time probably ever, and it was being validated by race results. Like, every time I showed up to a race, I was knocking big time off my personal best. When did it sort of explode, if that's the right word? 2016. <laughs> I just came back like absolutely swinging. I finished second at the US 10 mile championships. I ran a half marathon in 61 minutes, which at the time was like a top 25 US all time. I was all of a sudden competing on these stages that I never dreamed being at and running times that were crazy to me. And I had nothing to prove to anybody because nobody knew who I was. The train is on the tracks and there's just nothing that's ever going to slow it down. I qualified for the US track trials in the 10K. I was around my heroes and they were looking at me like, who, how did this guy like break into the track? They, I, they were like preparing to make the Olympic team and I was like looking for autographs. And the race was a train wreck. I finished dead last. I was lapped by the winner twice and I ran the slowest 10K I'd ever run in my life. But that night I went out to dinner with my family and they were playing a replay. And right as that was happening, my phone started just like exploding. And I had hundreds of not notifications. I had thousands of followers. It just blew my mind. The next day I did an interview. Um, I had like five beers. And uh, cause I was, my season was done. I was like having fun, you know? By the time I got back home, Big had released an article titled Meet Noah Drotti, the mustachioed beer drinking hero. And that changed, that, I mean, that kind of changed everything. By the time I raced again, I had a professional contract. For the first time in my running life, I had these expectations put on me, like I wasn't just representing Noah Drotti. I was representing a company and I was expected to hit marks and I was expected to market myself and make myself look good in their products. And it added just a whole world of pressure that I didn't realize how quickly it would like start to suffocate me. I was carrying this weight all the time and I got hurt almost immediately after signing it. Um, both my Achilles blew up like right after. And so I spent like almost a year just on the shelf. And when that happens, you're just immediately just like, I'm a fraud, you know? I like really pulled the wool over these guys. Like they they gave me this contract and here I am just sitting at home because I'd also stopped working. Like running went from a part of my life to all my life. And then I got hurt and I had nothing. I mean, that injury that I sustained then is like still something I deal with today. The homeless thing is like, definitely not throw, I'm definitely not trying to throw shade at the unhoused here, I'm just reading this. But it seems to be a theme. Here's a, another one that says, Jardy looks like a homeless guy who stole a new pair of shoes. It's been said a billion times. They, re 
It was the hair. Like when I first got into it, the long hair was like, it was like, oh, he's so cool. He drinks beer, he's so cool. But then like a couple of years later, it was like, oh, this guy's an unkempt garbage man. You know, it's weird how people just decide to turn, especially on something like so st stupid, like based on looks, it's just like, it's crazy. Social media or message boards or anything, I should say that like 99% of anything ever written about me or any comments I've ever seen about me have been positive. But, you know, when you become a known quantity, people will discuss you. You know, and if you don't have the strength not to look, you're gonna see stuff that is upsetting. A 210 marathoner just doesn't cut it anymore. Plus his hipster style just don't bode well for a lot of sponsors. If I had a product, I don't want this guy endorsing it. Sponsorship is all about selling. He looks like a guy who works at a pot dispensary. <laughs> it's pretty good. I was a 209 marathoner, just for like for the record when <laughs> When, this, uh, when that tweet was written. So yeah, at this point I was starting to see some of those comments and if I saw one negative thing, I would like thought spiral and wonder if they were right. I grew up playing in bands. In high school and college, I was playing in punk bands. I played guitar and though I'd sold my <laughs> electric guitar to pay rent. When I first moved out here, I was now in a position to get another one, so I bought a new guitar um, and started playing with a group of guys that called themselves Barry Mia. I played a show with them and just loved it. I was immediately transported back to high school Noah, just like pure joy. It was, you know, kind of like an ideal move for me, because it's not the way they saw me. They didn't see me as the runner, they saw me as the guitar player, and that was, like very refreshing, and if my running wasn't going well, it really didn't matter, because it didn't affect my guitar playing. When I graduated to the marathon, the decision was where can I go to run fast to like legitimize myself as a marathoner. I went to Chicago, failed. I went to Rotterdam, failed. When you're running on the track or you're running shorter races, next week you can try again. Two weeks you can try again. In the marathon, you really have to live in that place of success or failure for a long time. Today we're doing mile repeats, eight of them, with about three minutes of rest in between. So I think the goal is around 4.45 pace for those. And so we'll just kind of see. Marathon training is all just waiting to see how the body feels, so. 2019, I went to Chicago again, and everything clicked. I ran well, I ran 211, and felt like I'd kind of arrived in like the arena of my marathon potential for the first time, and then COVID hit. Yeah. Three, two, one, let's go, right, boys. All races were canceled, but Behind the scenes, people started pulling together this professional-only event that was gonna be held in December. They were gonna call it the Marathon Project, and it was just gonna be a flat course, good weather, controlled environment, and it was just became clear that this was gonna be the only place to race and a chance to take a huge swing. That race, was dis like December 20th or something, and my contract was set to expire on December 30th. And so I went to that race, like viewing, knowing that my like future in sport was on the chopping block if I didn't run well. I ran 209.09, um, finished second, which at the time put me ninth all time in the US on a record eligible course and just like elevated my status as a marathoner into elite company. It, I mean, the Marathon Project changed my life. Breaking 210 in the marathon was my, like, ultimate pie in the sky probably won't ever happen, but wouldn't it be cool goal. A super high point. 
followed by a super low point. Yeah. Um, yeah, because 10 days after that, my contract was not extended. And I was no longer a professional athlete in the wake of the best time I'd ever run. Races were still shut down for COVID. And I spent the next six months in this just limbo of wondering if it was over. And I was ready to just leave it behind, I think. In New York in November, that was my first real race as a Solomon athlete. Um, but I fractured my pelvis beforehand and tried to run the race anyway. And it's hard to run a marathon on a fractured pelvis. So I DNF'd and now I sit here like definitely in another redemption phase. Like maybe watching this people will understand that <laughs> it's like peak and valley, right? It's like, it's like success and then failure, and it kind of never ends, bouncing back between the two. Nobody has this like linear path of success, and so um, it's about learning how to res like respond to success and learning how to respond to failure, and right now I'm in a stage of responding to failure and feeling pretty motivated about it. Cut. I could say something like I'm aiming for redemption at yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I should be looking at Alex, right? Yeah. On December 4th, I'll be looking for some redemption at the U.S. Championships at the California International Marathon in Sacramento.